All right, um, let's get started. So welcome to lecture two, the first uh, real content lecture of uh, deep unsupervised learning. Let's start off with logistics, um, class registration. We worked through all the applications on Sunday. Some of you got a code to register. Use it as soon as you can. Um, then some of you got an email saying you will be somehow in the course, but we can't send you a code yet. We just received the code, so we'll try to send those codes tonight or tomorrow. And some of you got an email saying that, um, well, unfortunately, the class is full, actually. Um, you're welcome to audit, um, but you really shouldn't count on getting into the class. It's always possible. I mean, if some people drop, we're not going to keep those spots empty. We'll let more people in, but there's something like 50 people on the, on the wait list still, and probably only going to be like a handful of people dropping, I imagine, so don't count it for your units, um, but you're welcome to audit, and if something's up, something opens up, we'll, of course, fill the spot. Um, other things about logistics, our first homework will go out tomorrow or maybe Friday, but we're hoping tomorrow, and it will be due two weeks from yesterday. Um, yeah, that's it for logistics. Any uh, questions on that side? Oh, the other thing is we actually post slides before lecture. In this case, like two minutes before lecture. Um, <laughs> we'll try to post the night before when, whenever we can get the slides ready the night before, but last night the slides were still too far from what we're going to use today. It wasn't meaningful to, uh, to post them yet. Um, but now they're posted on Piazza, and in general, we try to do it the night before. All right, let's dive in then. Autoaggressive models. Outline for today. We'll look at some motivation, why we're going to be doing what we're doing. Then we'll look at some very simple generative models, um, histograms, which I suspect all of you have seen before, but it'll help us ground what we'll cover next into things we're already familiar with. And then the main chunk of lecture will be the modern neural autoaggressive models. And you'll see that this menu will actually expand a little bit. The further we're in the lecture, the more submenus will appear on the topic. So masking based models is probably really two thirds of the lecture, um, even though it looks like one bullet point right now. Okay, motivation. So what's the problem we'd like to solve? Well, there's a few things we'd like to do with the models we train on our unsurprised data. Um, one is generating data. That means just synthesize images, video, speech, um, be able to generate new images, let's say, that you've never seen before, but that somehow look like the images that you trained on, so they look like they're within distribution. Compressing data. Um, we're going to have actually a full lecture dedicated to compression, but kind of the, the preview at this point is that if you can train a model well, let me take a step back. When you look at the theory of compression, the quality of compression of your data is essentially going to be determined by the entropy of your data. Entropy is a measure of kind of disorder in your data. And the lower the entropy, the more you can compress. But to achieve that limit that you theoretically can achieve, you actually need to learn a model that models the distribution of your data as precisely as possible. And so the more precise your model of your data, then when you do entropy-based compression, you'll actually match with the data in the real world the way you design your compression scheme. So the better our uh, models, the better our compression will be. Anomaly detection. Imagine you get, you actually are doing supervised learning, and maybe an image comes in for your self-driving car, um, but it's very different from things you've seen before. If all you have is supervised learning, you have multi-way classification, it is kind of forced to make a decision what this might be, and it's usually not particularly well calibrated when it's out of distribution to do a uniform distribution on everything, because you haven't really trained it to do that. So if you had a generative model, you could evaluate the probability of the image you're seeing under your generative model, and that probability is very low compared to the probability of training data, then that means this is an unusual image that you're seeing, and maybe you cannot trust your classifier's decision on that image. So in likelihood-based mo likelihood models, we estimate the data distribution 
from some samples that come from the data distribution. So in reality, there's a true data distribution that you don't have access to. You have some samples from it, and the hope is that you can somehow fit a distribution to those samples that is close to the underlying data distribution. What we want is a distribution P that allows to compute the probability of another sample, uh, whether it's an image, video, speech, and so forth. We want to be able to compute the probability. Let me make sure this is off, actually. Um, we want to be able to compute the probability of your sample, and you want to be able to sample from the distribution. And we'll actually see that it's not always the case that um, just because you can evaluate the probability that you can sample easily, and it's not because you can sample easily that you can actually evaluate the probability. Um, with the models we'll see today, it'll be possible to do both. It'll turn out that computing the probability will be a lot cheaper than generating samples. That's a trade-off we're going to be making with the models we cover today. Today we'll look at discrete data, but these ideas that we cover today are actually going to carry over to future lectures where we'll have continuous data. And actually, popping one level up, another thing that kind of is a common thread across all the work on unsupervised learning is that, yes, one part is it's unsupervised learning. Another part is that a lot of innovation happens in neural net architectures to make this model succeed. And the neural net architecture innovations tend to carry over to other types of learning, whether it's reinforcement learning or, uh, or supervised learning. Okay, so what would be an example thing we might want to get out of our models? We're going to have maybe a distribution of complex high dimensional data, for example, 128 by 128 images, which are not even that big. I mean, that's about a little more than 10,000 pixels. You often have megapixel images or 10 megapixel images. So 128 by 128, then times three, because there is red, green, blue channels, a total of 50,000 dimensional space. So even what seems like a pretty small image actually lives in a 50,000 dimensional space. And so we're gonna, if we try to model distribution over images, we're gonna have to somehow model distribution in a very high dimensional space. So we're gonna have to keep that in mind. Um, we're not gonna be happy with just low things that only work in low dimensions. What do we want? Um, we want computational efficiency and statistical efficiency. Computational efficiency means that whatever operation we do should not take much time. Statistical efficiency means that it should be such that we don't need an insane amount of data to start to understand the patterns in the data with the model we use. So, concretely, it means we want efficient training, both computationally and statistically, and model representation. We want expressiveness and generalization. So, we want to be able to express, you know, let's say any image or any sequence of words or characters or any um, sequence of uh, sound generated. We want good sample quality and speed and further down the road, we'll see if we have good generative models, we should be able to turn that into um, a good compression scheme. So let's start with something I think all of you are familiar with to just ground this discussion, histograms. Oh, how does that happen? Um, the goal we have is estimating somehow the underlying data distribution from samples from that distribution. Let's consider a very simple scenario to build some intuition. Let's imagine we have a discrete random variable, and it can take on the values from 1 through 100. And then we sample from the distribution, and we can actually then plot what these samples look like. And what the plot here means if something is high, means that that thing was sampled more often. So um, in the train set, there was the highest peak is around 0 0.06, which means 6% chance of sampling the number 81, it seems. Um, so that's what that graph means, the probability distribution induced by the samples. Well, if that's your sample distribution, a very simple thing to do to model it would be to just say, OK, what I just plotted here is already my model. I'm just going to say um, probability of you know, 81 is 0 0.06. Probability of a 1 is, seems like, really, really low, uh, some very low number, and so forth. And so that's what, you, that's what you can do, and you could call it done. Um, it's a very simple scheme. It's efficient. 
both for learning, because you have to do almost no computation for learning, um, and it's very fast to sample from, and we'll see that in a moment. And the idea of how, to, how we sample from this we'll, we'll need in the future also. So, inference is just a lookup. If somebody tells you, I got an 81, you can just look in the table and say, oh, 0 0.06, and you're done. Sampling, how do you do that? Um, the way to sample from an arbitrary distribution for a one-dimensional distribution is to look at the cumulative distribution. What does that mean? We can go back to this graph here, and we can say, okay, the total probability mass under this graph should be one. And what I can do is I can sample a number between zero and one, uniform distribution. I assume I have access to that. So that's a primitive we'll assume we have access to, uniformly sampling from the interval zero to one. Once you have that sample, and maybe it's, I don't know, the sample might be 0 0.5 or something. If the sample is 0 0.5, then we'd kind of count how much probability mass we encounter going from left to right until we have encountered 0 0.5 probability mass. And wherever we are, once we have encountered 0 0.5 probability mass, that's the number we choose. If we sampled 0 0.9, we do the same thing. We'd kind of run through, see once we, when do we have encountered 0 0.9, maybe somewhere around here and we'd output the corresponding number. And this is a very generic way to turn a uniform, sample from a uniform distribution into a sample from an uh, arbitrary distribution. Question, yes? So how are these histograms actually represented as functions, especially in high dimensions? Yeah, the, good question. So the question is, how do you even represent this in high dimensions? You're essentially anticipating two slides down, so perfect question, and uh, we'll get at it there. So I talked about the cumulative distribution by looking at the histogram. In principle, you can pre-compute this. You can essentially, every step along the way, have a number that you store, and so then you'll have a graph that goes from zero up to one, progressing as you have more and more probability mass encountered, and you can essentially just do a binary search on that graph to find the point where you have whatever your sample was, 0 0.7. Okay, so at this point, are we done? Um, well, let's see. Perfect question was asked. How do you do this in high dimensions? Um, even MNIST, which is even smaller than what we talked about earlier, Im images are, let's say, 28 by 28, and binarized MNIST, um, we turn them into white, black pixels, so it's just one bit. Um, but even so, that's about 10 to the 236 probabilities we need to estimate if you want to build a histogram. That's the number of different images that are possible in a 28 by 28 binary image. So if you build a histogram for that, well, if you get some training data, there is no way you're anywhere close to, to covering that space. So you'll get very sparse training data points relative to the space that you're working in, and your histogram will be fairly meaningless because it'll not really capture patterns in your data. I'll give you more concrete numbers. The MNIST data set, so it's a digit data set that a lot of people use for kind of you know, very fast, quick first experiments. Um, typically you have about maybe 60,000 uh, training examples, and so 60,000 is, well, 10 to the 4, let's say. Um, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, which is much smaller than 10 to the 236. And so clearly that existing data set is not going to cover any part of this space, and a histogram will look meaningless. So. That means even though it might still be very efficient to use a histogram, when we then see test data, we'll always say probability zero because it'll be different from our training data and not generalized, so not a great thing to work with. There's another thing. Even for a single variable, um, learning histograms can actually be pretty problematic. Oh, thanks, Wilson. Because even for a single variable, when you, um, let's say, get some data, uh, from your underlying data distribution, your training set, look at the test set sampled from the same distribution. They actually don't look exactly the same. And there are some kind of holes in the training uh, set where you say, well, if you look at this, probably the pattern is that this should be a lot smoother. I shouldn't just assume that just because one over it's a lot lower, that that's actually true. It's just a random thing in the training data. And so even for this kind of distribution, it gives pretty poor generalization to just use a histogram. What else can we do? Well, ideally it might fit something like this. 
So you might fit some kind of smoother distribution to the training data such that that smoother distribution can actually generalize um, to the test data. Okay, let me switch to, let's take a two minute break so I can switch to my iPad. Thanks for getting that, Wilson. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go, great. So, we're gonna parameters our models. Um, our data will still come from the data distribution and we'll introduce function approximation. So, instead of having histogram, we'll have some model P theta of X, where theta are our parameters that we're trying to figure out, and we wanted to get as close as possible to the data distribution. So the question we're gonna to have to ask is, how do we design these function approximators to effectively represent joint distributions over maybe high dimensional variables X, yet at the same time, keep it easy to train? And then there will be many, many uh, choices for our model design, and each will have some trade-offs, and we need to think about those. Often thing to keep in mind is that choosing your model architecture and your training procedure actually kind of go hand in hand. So certain training procedures will work better with certain architectures. So fitting distributions, what's the underlying principle? There is some true distribution that of course we wish we could represent with our parameterized distribution P theta. And effectively it's just a search problem. You have a parameterized set of distributions and as you vary the parameter theta, you'll have a different, different distribution. Very simple case, Gaussian, theta would be mean and variance. As you vary theta, this very mean and variance, you have a different distribution. And different choices will have a better fit to your data, and so we have a loss function that's supposed to capture how well the choice of parameter theta leads to a distribution that's a good fit for our data. What do we want from this loss function and search procedure? We wanted to work with large data sets, so you know, number of data points could be millions, we wanted to find a theta such that P theta matches P data as close as possible. And um, keep in mind we can never see P data, you can only have access to individual samples from the data distribution. So we're gonna want it to generalize from those samples. You know, the most common objective when you look at estimating distributions is the likelihood objective. So the idea here is that you wanna find a set of parameters theta such that you maximize the probability of your data. So P theta of X i is probability of data point i. Maximizing probability of the data is the same as maximizing log probability of the, the data. So we're gonna maximize the sum of the log probabilities of the data points, but because in all, most of the kind of learning frameworks people have minimization uh, setups, we're gonna say we're gonna minimize the negative log probability of each data point. Statistics then tells that if the model family is expressive enough and if enough data is given, then solving this problem will yield real parameters that can also generate the data. We express it here as minimizing the negative log probability or maximizing the log likelihood of the data. Um, equivalently, you can think of this as minimizing the KL divergence, which is a very common metric of divergence between two distributions, the KL divergence between the um, empirical distribution of the data samples and the parameterized distribution P theta of X. And so you can think of it as, okay, minimize that KL or maximize log likelihood. Okay, how to maximize such an objective or minimize the negative log objective? Um, well, the common tool in the toolbox is do local optimization. It's not clear how, if your parameters are, space is very high dimensional, it's not clear how you're gonna exactly find which one is the best one by looking at all of them. You're gonna just make a guess and then tweak your parameters locally to become better and better and better. So stochastic gradient descent, what does it do? It looks at the objective and says, okay, let me compute the gradient of the objective, take a step in that direction. If it's SGD, maybe on just one data point or a mini batch of data points, take the gradient of the objective, take a step in, that, in the, descent direction and repeat. Actually, cool question. Anybody, everybody here has seen great SGD and maximum likelihood before? Okay, great. So, now that you know what we're gonna do, it's a question of designing the model. Um, we're gonna choose models that are deep neural networks. So P of theta will be a deep neural network, um, which will allow it to be very expressive. Question. Yeah, 
So question is, if we try to maximize the likelihood, um, how well would the histogram score? So the histogram will score really, really well. But the way we're going to maximize the likelihood, we're going to have a train and validation set. And we're going to track likelihood on the validation, validation set. And so when you work with a histogram, you're actually going to have pretty poor score on the validation set. Um, whereas with a parameterized distribution, as you optimize likelihood on the training set, you'll see it improve also on the validation set. And at some point, you'll stop training because you're, you would otherwise start overfitting the training set. So very good point. And if all you care about is likelihood on the training set, histogram will score really well. But we want to generalize. So we actually want something that does well on the validation set and then later test set. <coughs> So in terms of representing this, the thing we need to think about is when you have a neural network um, you need to, and you want to represent a distribution, you need to somehow output a probability for each possible image, let's say. So you feed in an image, and it's supposed to say, this has this much probability. And so what does that mean? Outputting a number between 0 and 1. Um, so you need to output between 0 and 1. That's easy. Um, sigmoid will do that for you. But then the other thing you need is that you need to be the case that if you output Every possible image that could ever exist that has non-zero probability, you output all of them one at a time. You look at the outputs and you sum it up. It's got to sum to one. Otherwise, it's not a proper distribution over images. And so that means that you can't just naively take any neural network and say, oh, I'm just going to you know, assume that it's OK to increase the likelihood of my training data or something. Because if you increase the probability of every training data point, you're not normalizing anymore. Um, if you're not careful. So we'll need to be very careful how we design the network to ensure things sum to one. So one place you might have seen high dimensional distributions is when you might have seen Bayesian networks in the past. And actually what we'll cover today, even though not necessarily everybody thinks of it as base nets, in many ways they are base nets. Um, now base net, in his, this case, BaysNet has five random variables. It's modeling distribution over five random variables. And it's saying, to model that distribution, I'm going to actually apply something called the chain rule. So it's going to say, OK, the distribution over B, E, A, J, M is always representable as for distribution over the first variable, then second variable given first, third variable given the first two, fourth variable, given the ones coming before, times fifth variable, given all the ones coming before. This here is just chain rule. Always possible. Now, what's common practice in BaysNets is to say, well, chain rule, it's nice, very general, um, but um, maybe, you know, there's other assumptions we can make and introduce some sparsity and say, OK, instead of conditioning on um, everything here, when we say M given J, A, A, and B, we're just going to replace this by M given A. That's an assumption. You're saying in the distribution, I'm assuming the distribution over M given A is the same as M given A and J and E and B. It's often a strong assumption. You might not want it. In some cases, it might be OK. Why do BaseNets make these assumptions? It makes things representable. Because now all of a sudden, since you think about the BaseNet, you have probability of your variable i variable given variables 1 through i minus 1. How large is this table? It's going to be size if it's all binary 2 to the i, which is very large. We have a large number of variables. But if you reduce what you condition on, your table becomes smaller. And so the trick played here is sparsity to result in smaller tables that you need for these conditionals to be able to represent things and able to learn them efficiently from data. Now, the trend we have seen uh, recently, and a lot of the models we'll cover in class today, is a little different. It's essentially saying we're happy to condition on everything, but we're going to not represent the conditioning as a table. We're going to represent the conditioning as a neural network. And so we hope that this neural net will somehow generalize. We'll see more details later. But it's a very different kind of mindset. But in some sense, it starts from the same point. Chain rule always works. 
but then Bayesians say make it sparse to make it representable. Other of models that we'll cover will say uh, something more along the lines of um, parameterize that conditional probability table in a way that it has a small number of parameters compared to two to the two to the power number of other variables in the network, which would be uh, in the in the random variable, which would be very large. Okay, so autoregressive models. We're going to look at the log probability of data points. Data point X will have many, many entries in it. If it's an image, um, my every pixel is an entry in X, and maybe each color channel of each pixel is an entry in X. This here is just base nets. This is the chain rule, the more general version. Um, and instead of calling it a chain rule model, people call it an autoaggressive model. Just a terminology thing, but if you're more familiar with business, you say, okay, it's just a you know, straight up chain rule model, but we'll call it autoaggressive models. So we're gonna wanna learn models of this type, where of course then this thing here is gonna end up being parameterized somehow in a way that we're gonna learn. So let's look at a very, very simple autoaggressive model. We'll have two variables x1, x2. So the model is a joint distribution over x1 and x2. Um, chain rule says marginal over x1 times conditional of x2 given x1. And let's keep it simple for now. x1 is still a histogram, so nothing has changed there. Then x2, we need to condition the value of x2 on x1. Now, in principle, you could have a histogram for every possible value x1 takes on, but that would be very expensive because now you have not just a histogram that's expensive, but many, many, many histograms for just that one variable x2. So instead, we're going to parameterize it with a multilayer perceptron. And the output distribution, the output is going to be distribution over x2, which could be, let's say, a softmax output if x2 has maybe 256 possible values, like a pixel value often has. Um, then you have 256 outputs, softmax makes it normalized to one. So we can set this up, right? Somebody can give you that data and you can train a histogram for X1 and then you can train a multilayer perceptron that will look something like X1 goes in, some processing, some processing, and then a um, softmax over possible X2 values comes out, and that's gonna be our joint distribution. Okay, does it extend to high dimensions? Well, to some extent it does actually. Um, when you have um, d-dimensional data, you'll have ordered d parameters, because you have a multilayer perceptron for every new variable you need to sample or generate, you're gonna, you could down a network. Um, so it's much better than the exponential thing we saw if you just naively histogram things out. Um, but it's still not great because D could be pretty large and that might make it impractical. The other thing is that by using a new neural network for every new variable, um, you have limited generalization. Um, you might hope that when you generate maybe X10 from X1 through 9, that whatever you process X1 through 9 for to generate X10, that when you try to generate X11, that it might share some processing on X1 through X9 to be more efficient statistically to, generate, to learn to generate X11. How we're gonna do this, there's two major lines of work, recurrent networks and masking. Let me pause here, see if there are any questions um, before we dive into the two types of models we'll cover. Yes? So I guess one thing um, about this histogram versus function approximation that's not clear to me is, you know, um, as he said, the, the histogram is sort of the maximum likelihood of success. Mm -hmm. assumptions on the model. Uh, with the multi-layer perceptron, because of the universal approximation here, we can approximate any function. So what's stopping you from learning a histogram? So the question is, imagine you are training a multi-layer perceptron like shown here. And given that we know on the training data, the maximum score will be achieved by exactly matching the training data, which will correspond to a histogram, how come we don't end up with that same thing possibly represented as a multi-layer perceptron, then, and then what was the point of having the multilayer perceptron? Well, why would we get anything better along the way? 
So the reason in practice this works better is because you make careful choices of what you put here. And so by making interesting choices there, you build in a prior over what you think your data is going to be like. And by building in that prior in the architecture and for supervised learning, which the assumptions you've all seen in image processing, the prior tends to be, okay, sp spatial proximity kind of matters. So um, Convnets with local filters make sense to process image data. We're going to see similar things here. We're going to have priors of the same type that say, okay, when we process an image, locality can matter. Same with process text. Words that are nearby might be more related than words that are very far apart. Not that the far apart ones are not related, but it might be less related than the ones close by. And so similar priors that we see in supervised learning will play a role in unsupervised learning to ensure that what you learn here is something that as your training will do initially improve performance on both training and holdout data. And then at some point that might stop. You might still improve on the training data. If you kept running, you'd have a perfect fit of your training data, but on your holdout data, you wouldn't do so well anymore. And so it's really about the architecture that's here that ensures that you have essentially a smoothness prior, a simplicity prior um, over what your model will be like. When you fit a histogram, you have no prior. I mean, you could, I mean, you could play all kind of games with histograms. You could say, I'm going to fit a histogram where um, to decide what is in bin 10, I'm going to do some weighted average of what's in my data in 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And so you can get some smoothing effect on your histogram if you want to. Um, but if you do direct histogram fitting, you will have no smoothing effect. Um, the bigger issue with histograms, aside from not being smooth, because that's fixable that way, is just that they're very unwieldy in high dimensional spaces. You can't, essentially, you don't have space in memory to represent a full histogram over the data distribution that you're looking at. Or the, in, if it's in a high dimensional space, let's say, I don't know, 10 to the 230, you can't populate that histogram in a clean way. So, and sometimes the simplest oh, other question. So that's a good question. So in classical statistics, there are autoaggressive models, and that is where the terminology comes from. So in classical statistics, there's this notion that you essentially can have different orders of autoaggressive models depending on how far in the past. It's often time series, how far in the past you condition on. Um, here, it won't be as focused on time series per se, but it also applies to time series, but that's definitely where the name comes from. Correct, we'll see that in a moment. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's an example of a autoaggressive model in the form of a recurrent neural network. So what are we doing here? We're trying to model the probability of a high dimensional variable x. In this case, x could be um, a sequence of characters. For example, could be uh, the word hello, and so x, is a five-dimensional var five variable where each entry can take maybe 26 if all you have is letters, but you might have more, you might have uh, other um, symbols, you might have capitalization and so forth. So maybe, I don't know, 256 possible values it can take on at each entry. And so we're trying to model distribution over what are likely X instantiations. Why doesn't RNN make sense? What happens in an RNN is that you say, well, I'm going to estimate the probability of the next <laughs> variable condition on everything that came before. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say, okay, rather than directly feeding everything that came before into some kind of multilayer perceptron that then has to decide what the probability is reaching over next, it's going to generate a hidden state. So this comes in here, generates a hidden state. From there, it's going to make a prediction, distribution over possible values at the second position in the word. Then, same thing here, this hidden state will then propagate. Once it's seen the first two, to decide distribution over the third one, is gonna not directly look back here, that's not happening, it's actually using this hidden state. It's looking at bringing the second character, predicting third one. Um, and this repeats, and so the further you go forward, you see that 
the more in some sense you save. The naive model would condition this thing directly on this, 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 through some multiple layers of processing. But here, um, in the RNN, what happens is we have a parameter sharing happening where as we condition, as we condition, we're just conditioning every time on hidden state to generate and hidden state comes from the last character and previous hidden state. And so this gives a lot of parameter sharing because we only have parameters essentially on here. There are some parameters living here. There are some parameters living here and here. But if we call this theta maybe three, two, one, this is also theta one, this is also theta one, this is also theta one, this one is also theta two, this is also theta two, and so forth. So as the sequence becomes longer, the number of parameters we need to learn is not increasing, it stays constant. And so this is a very efficient way to, um, in terms of statistical efficiency, to represent your model. Now, I can actually also do this for MNIST, even though people don't typically run recurrent neural networks on MNIST, we can take a look at that. So 28 by 28, 60,000 training data points, 10,000 test data points. Um, original MNIST is grayscale, but we can binarize it into black and white. Here are some original data points. And so what would we hope for? The hope would be that if you train an RNN, that it would be able to then generate new images. And so you might have a order. You say top left is first, then the pixel next to it, next to it, you go left to right, top row, next row, left to right, next row, left to right. And so you just raster scan through your image, and now your image has become a sequence. It's a sequence of 28 times 28 numbers. Um, you can train an RNN on that. In fact, Wilson uh, did it. And here's what it looks like. So um, what you see is um, a grid of 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, 4, 6, a grid of 8 by 8, so 64 different images generated from this RNN. And you can see in initialization, random initialization of the RNN, it's not outputting interesting images. But as you are, um, in this case, 19 epochs in, you actually get things that look like MNIST digits. Going back to the question, okay, how efficient are things? Are we building in priors to have better generalization? You might say, well, a sequence model seems not that great um, for building images. Um, why? Well, think about it. Use the same thing to go from pixel one to two, two to three, three to four, and so forth. Um, and then when you go from 28 to 29, you're actually going from all the way to the right to all the way to the left. Your model has no, no clue about that because, well, it's just the next one. Um, so that's not going to be very good. Your model, as you're coming through, let's say on pixel 29, you'd really want to look at pixel one that's above you, but you're in this long chain, so you probably have a very hard time for signal to propagate from there. So there's a lot of reasons why this might not be what you want to do for images. But in terms of autoaggressive modeling, this is, the, in so many ways, the simplest thing you could do. So it could be a reasonable starting point. Any thoughts on how we can fix some of those issues? Yeah. Do you just like model it as a pen moving over paper? Um, you then would have some sort of sequence of a, of a pen position mm -hmm. that better capture writing digits. OK, I like that suggestion. Just repeating it for people who are not here. Can you return the mic? Um, what if you model the motion of a pen on a piece of paper? Um, that motion might be a lot more structured and might be much shorter sequence than 28 times 28 pixels to step through. I like that suggestion. We don't have that ready on the slides for you, but I like it. Maybe somebody should try to extra credit on the homework or something. Curious how it goes. There was another suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is how to pass information in other directions. Can, can that be done? Um, so if you think about it, well, what that would require is that your RNN maybe has some skip connections, right? It skips from one also to 29. So it also knows that in some sense there's always multiple things coming in. Some things coming from the left and some things coming from above. Um, that, that could, 
That is, I would say, the foundation of what we'll do when we do mask models. We'll do something that's a lot like that, even though we will not call it an RNN, we'll call it a mask model and we'll call it a pixel CNN, but it's much uh, what you're describing. The simplest thing we can actually do, which fixes at least one part of what's going uh, maybe not so great here, is we can actually just do position encoding. So any given pixel you generate, you can feed in the coordinates. You can say, okay, when you're supposed to generate the 29th pixel, it's at coordinate um, one and two. Uh, so in the first column and second row down. And so you could just feed that in as additional thing to condition on. And that way, at least you know when you're skipping to the next row and your RNN should probably learn that, you know, when you skip to a new row, um, something's happening where you don't look as much as what was right before. Um, it, should probably also, it should also be able to remember in its hidden state if it wants to um, what's happening in different rows, such that when you come back to the, uh, in different columns and you come to the next row, you know what's happening in the column above you and can bring that in. So, ran that experiment. Um, it gives um, so much sharper uh, images that are being generated because it has the extra information of just um, location, uh, pixel location appended into the RNN. So just to be more specific, what would happen is the RNN would look something like, well, you'd have the first pixel, let's call it, well, let's maybe call it the um, pixel at zero, zero. It's generated. It goes, clean this up. Your pixel at zero, zero is generated goes through some processing, generates a hidden state. This is your hidden state at time zero, zero. Then this would go to somehow generate your pixel at one, one, uh, not one, one, zero, one, but hat, your estimated pixel there. Then you would look at zero, one, that's the real one here as you're training, or if you were sampling, you'd have to use the sampled one process that, go in, generates the next hidden state. This also goes in here, um, goes up, comes out zero, two. And so feeding the, the coordinates would mean that when you feed in, let's say, um, the fact here that you're generating zero, two, you wouldn't just condition on the hidden state, which is here, we would also get the condition on the coordinates. So you'd explicitly feed in coordinates from somewhere. Maybe in addition to hidden state here, you'd have explicitly coordinates zero, two, because that's what you're supposed to generate. Together, they get fed up to generate the pixel that's being generated over there. In terms of how you train this, um, whether it has the ex extra condition or not, training is actually fairly uh, straightforward. It's just regular RNN training. Uh, at training time, you are able to fill in the entire bottom and the entire top. And for every, every one of them, you can just look at, okay, maximize probability of this one, given as I do my forward pass, everything I've processed so far. And at test time, you'd have to, this, uh, generation time, you'd have to take this thing and put it here to continue generating. All right, those are the basics. Hopefully many of you had I've seen those things before. Let's pause here just to see if there's any questions about that, and then we'll go into the main topics for today. <coughs> All right, so masking-based models. Um, it's the kind of other major branch of autoregressive models. Um, what's the key property? They tend to have parallelized computation for all conditions, all conditionals. So that's nice. You don't need to um, go through this chain. Um, it's going to somehow mask a regular neural network is what we'll see happen. And this could be a regular MLP or it could be convolutions or self-attention. So the, the building blocks you've seen in regular um, neural net training, MLP, convolution, self-attention are going to come back here just used uh, to generate samples. Was a question somewhere? Yes. I'm sorry, but the last time I explained, is that simple encoder decoder network? Where? Uh, the previous slide. Here? Yeah. Is this a simple encoder decoder network? 
Um, I wouldn't say it's a, I, th I think the simplest way to think of it is that it's a recurrent neural network, right? Because it has, I mean, here's the kind of printed picture of the recurrent neural network. Um, it has a hidden layer going in the middle. The hidden layer is, in some sense, an encoding of everything you've seen so far, but it's a very specific way of encoding. It's encoding by using an RNN, which has a lot of parameter sharing, compared to a lot of encoders uh, will be structured differently, where you kind of take in everything at once, then generate a hidden variable that then you can expand back out to um, the original. And here we are stepping through the input variables one at a time, bringing them in one at a time to accumulate our hidden state as we progress. Okay, the first one we will study is MADE. Um, so, Mast Autoencoder for Distribution Estimation. What's the model here? Um, imagine you have a standard autoencoder, and that's on the slide here, it's, it comes from directly from the paper. Um, at the time, it was very common to try to learn representations um, by putting noise on the data. You could say, I have some data. Here is just three variables. We can imagine it's an image, many, many pixel values. And you say, I want to learn about what images are like. Well, one way to learn about it is say, I have a real image. I'm now going to put noise on it, and I need to denoise it into the original image. And if I can train a neural network that turns a noisy image into the original, then that neural network understands something about what images could be like. So that's a way to generate images that was pretty common at the time. What it doesn't really do, if you just train a denoising autoencoder, what you don't have is a probability. If you train a denoising autoencoder, you will turn a noisy image into hopefully a non-noisy image, but if you give it an actual image, you cannot output a probability. What's the probability of this image compared to another image? There's no such thing coming out of that model. So the question asked at the time was, okay, can we somehow use similar ideas but output a probability? And you can say, well, how could we output a probability? Well, it's already outputting in the denoising autoencoder, it's already outputting a probability for x1, x2, x3 hat. It's outputting a distribution. If it's pixels, it might be 0, 1 if it's binarized, or 0 to 255 for grayscale. It's outputting a distribution. It's just that it's not normalized in any meaningful way. So the question is, can we make a small fix such that this thing that we output, which is probability for distribution for x1, x2, x3, somehow together makes for a distribution that's normalized. Well, remember the chain rule. If we somehow structure the model, the first output x1, let's say, and after the out output x1, conditioned on x1, output x2, and then conditioned on x1 and x2, output x3, then we have a proper probability distribution. So we just need to set it up that way. Now, this model is not set up that way. What you can do is you can remove a bunch of the edges and it'll automatically be set up that way. So what we see here is, it actually starts with x2 in this case. This thing is just generated on its own. There is no dependence on um, any inputs. There's no path from the inputs to x2. It's on its own generated. What's generated next? Um, X3 is generated next, and let's look at the path. Where is X3 coming from? It's coming from here and here. It's coming from here and here, which is in turn coming from here. So when we generate X3, the only thing it can see as X3 is being generated is X2. How about X1? Well, for x1, it's this path, this path, this path, this path. Well, it's everything. Then this goes, I mean, it's following all these edges as a consequence. And so, but when we look at the end here, we see there is no connection to x1. So in generating x1, the green paths only connect us to x2 and x3. So if we use this denoising autoencoder, it can even, you could even have trained it as a denoising autoencoder, not saying that's how you should train it, but you could have done it. 
the result is a neural network that can now be used to output the probability of any image, and it'll be a normalized distribution. We know because it's general, it's px2 times px3 given x2 times px1 given x2 and x3. So this might seem pretty arbitrary, like, and that maybe this, you know, with these three variables, and we kind of had to paint into that network how we're going to structure it, and maybe that's um, not that convenient. We can actually do this in a much more structured way. So let's draw out the general principle. So what does a made model look like? It's a chain rule model. Okay. So let's say we have some variables. X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, X6. And we somehow want to output the probability of the values they're taken on. And we're going to apply chain rule. We're going to have multilayer processing. So they go in here, but then you have maybe you know, some layer here, another layer here, another layer here, and then you're outputting the probability of P for x1, P for x2 given x1, P for x3 given x1 and 2, P for x4 given x1 through 3, P for x5 given x1 through 4, and then P for x6 given x1 through 5. Okay, so P of x1 cannot depend on anything. So we can't do much. P of x2 given x1 can, so this thing here can depend on x1, but only x1. So what does that mean? We can, for example, say, okay, um, x2 can depend on x1. So we'll say, okay, x1 can go to the layer, the horizontal layer for x2. And this can go this way, this way, this way. And this can happen also if we want to. It's not going to do much, but it's allowed to happen. And in fact, this can even happen over here. So this network is a valid network um, to have distribution for x1 and x2 given x1. Then how about x3? It can only depend on x1 and x2. So we cannot feed x3 into this layer, but we can feed in x2 and x1. And then from here onwards, this can continue, and this can also take in things from above, no problem. And we have our distribution for x3 given x1 and x2. I mean, it's a good distribution, depends on the weights on these edges. If you have the right parameters on these edges, it'll be a good distribution for your data. If you have the wrong parameters on these edges, it'll not be a good distribution. You can keep repeating this now for x4. Um, you, can you can get in x1, x two, x three, but not x four, and then same thing here and everything coming in from above. So you get the picture. Now this picture can even be more general. Right now I drew it as equally many hidden units in every layer, but I don't need to do it that way. I can think of any one of these if you look on the inside as having maybe many, many hidden units on the inside. And the same thing will still be true. I still have a clean separation of signal from x1 on the input not reaching x1, but only the next ones. And so don't think of it as specific to the number of inputs needs to be the number of hidden units. You can have an arbitrary number of hidden units. You just need to organize them in a way that the signal cannot reach the original. So you cannot have a pass from x4 to x4 here. And that's actually ensured right here because we don't make the connection. And then in the remainder, that's ensured by only getting things from above and same layer. Note that these are then a name like, like this is, you can call it type A and this type B. There's two types of layers. All these layers are identical in terms of structure. This layer is different. This layer is the one that prevents that, that doesn't have the horizontal edge. All the others do have the horizontal edge. 
does it have to be in the beginning type A? You can put type A at the end. You can put the type A layer anywhere in the middle. You just need to have one of the layers be a type A layer to ensure there's no horizontal propagation happening, so you block that signal. So that's the general version of MADE. Um, and you can apply this to, principle to any network. I drew, what I drew here is essentially a mask applied to a fully, series of fully connected layers. But if you had a different architecture that you like, that goes from input to output, you can apply the same masking. Key here is that you're only allowed to have paths from the variables that come before you. And you need to erase any other paths that should not exist anymore. You could have something that looks more like common. We'll see that later. You could mask things out to make sure there's no path uh, coming to you. I number the variables here, x1 through x6. Um, that gives some kind of meaning. It, it kind of might be that that's the right structure, but it could be that's the wrong ordering for you. Maybe you want to reorder them. The ordering doesn't really matter. It's an arbitrary permutation that you can use and make this work. And in fact, um, let's see if we got some results here first. Um, actually, let's pause here, because this is probably one of the two most important concepts for today's lecture. Make sure that this is fully understood and also fully understood how this actually quite straightforward to do. Um, you just need to mask out a bunch of edges, make them zero in whatever original architecture you had. Yes? Uh, could you imagine that there's more like two public variables that vary a very strong correlation, um, but because of the ordering, they happen to be very far apart? Is that not a concern? So yeah, the question is, in some sense, does the ordering matter? Yeah. Because maybe some orderings are smart, some are not smart, because well, the way the connectivity is set up, um, it, it's, not all, it's not, I mean, if you look at, once you choose an ordering, you get a network, you choose a different ordering, the connectivity will be quite different. And so, yes, the, the ordering can matter, and we'll show some experiments where different orderings have different qualities of results. Olivia. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, and we're also getting to that, but I'll, I think it's good to highlight it already now. So the way I've drawn this is essentially a fixed mask made. It seems that this is the ordering of variables you have. The ordering of variables implies this mask. And now you could do, if you had data, x1 through x6, you could feed it in, process by your network, and maximize the log probabilities on each of these outputs to train your network. Then what you could do, you could actually feed the same data in again and decide that the ordering you're using is different and then the masking of your network will be different, but it could be the same network. So you essentially have parameter sharing across many different orderings of your variables, but with the same network. And that can absolutely be done and actually gives, gives better results to just, not if you have all the orderings it seems, but if you have a modest number of orderings, um, it seems to generalize better than using just a single ordering. Question there. So this thing that you just talked about um, seems like essentially a bootstrap estimator. And I'm wondering if there's a connection there between you know, estimating standard errors and probabilities um, using such a method. Let's say that offline, because I don't have an immediate answer for that, and so I need to think about it a little bit okay. offline. Other questions about this? OK, so that's made. Um, you can train a MADE model on MNIST. So it's essentially multi-layer perceptron on MNIST. In goes an image, out comes you know, probability of the pixel in that image, but your masking pattern ensures that you can't just look it up on the input. Um, initialization, epoch 0, epoch 1, 2, 8, and at 19. It's actually starting to generate, these are samples, trying to generate pretty good sam MNIST samples. Note that this multi-layer perceptron has no kind of knowledge about um, location the way a convolutional network would have. Um, but, you know, if you train um, with enough data, and on the, it's not the hardest kind of data, um, using just this kind of model actually works just fine. So we've actually seen two ways now to design autoregressive models for MNIST. You can do RNN, which is very naive. You could do an RNN augmented with um, coordinates. That will work a little better. But then here you can do something else that's also quite naive for images. And it also works pretty well in small images like that. Yes? So, uh, so on made here, you would do basically take random pixels and then that would be the order. 
So the ordering picked here is raster scan ordering. Is that right? Well, you ran the experiments. Is that correct, Wilson? Yeah, so raster scan ordering. So you'd go top left, go line by line, and that's the ordering in which things get laid out. But you're absolutely right that the, even though we look at it as, a, as an image as 2D, it's laid out as just one long sequence, and then MLP is applied with masking to ensure it can go straight through to predict itself. So here are some um, probabilities from the original paper um, showing that um, if you, in this case, negative log probability, lower is better. Um, two hidden layers, 32 masks, um, which means you, you, know, you, you can try multiple masks, as we talked about, at the same time, um, gives the best score here. Um, these are small models. This was from, the original is from quite a few years ago now, I think three or four years ago, so um, you could probably try this again today. You might want to try bigger models, and maybe you can work with um, more masks then. Um, here is another thing to analyze in the paper, is to look at um, nearest neighbor. So something that's interesting to do when you train, and this goes back to the histogram thing, question from earlier, um, how do we know we're not ending up with under the hood just learning a histogram of our training data, and that we're actually generalizing? Um, well, one way to look at this is to generate samples from your network that you just trained, and then as you generate samples, you go in your training data and you look up the nearest neighbor, so pixel level nearest neighbor calculation, and then visualize that. And if that's always identical to what you generated, it means you effectively, gen effectively memorize the training data. That's typically not what you want. But if it's similar, yet different, it means you might have learned the pattern of what is in your training data rather than just memorize it. And so that's exactly what we see happen here. They look similar to things in the training data, most of them, um, but aren't exactly copies of something in the training data. You can do made with different orderings. So here we're comparing a random permutation, samples from that. So the question was if you have certain things that are more connected than others. Well, random permutation is not the best, it turns out. Um, it's better to use raster scan ordering, it seems. Even then odd, so skipping over one pixel every time and then doing the left half pixels in a second pass in the second half of your generation. Um, it's kind of, I mean, it gets some kind of structure, but it's, it's definitely not great. And this is MNIST. I mean, the, the kind of thing in general is if, if you have an idea is any good, it should definitely succeed on MNIST because that's a relatively small data set and easy to tune hyperparameters on and so forth. Then um, rows, um, raster scan, columns, raster scan, pretty similar. Um, top to bottom, bottom to middle, also pretty similar, maybe a little worse than the raster scan uh, orderings. Yes? Oh, bits per dim, good question. So bits per dim is a, there's two standard metrics to score um, your likelihood model. So we maximize log probability or minimize negative log probability um, on our training data. Then we go to test data. And on the test data, we evaluate the log probability of each test input. So you feed in the MNIST image and look at what's the log probability of this image. But to standardize it across dimensionalities of images to make it comparable across different data sets, instead of just looking at the log probability of a 28 by 28 binarized MNIST image, and say you're gonna express a score as um, number of bits per dim. Uh, bits per dim looks at essentially the, if it's, well, imagine it's a um, RGB image, then uh, one pixel has three dimensions, R, G, and B. If it's a grayscale or binary image, then there's only one dimension. Um, so then um, the question is, you look at the, you look at the log, two log, under the two log, the, the probability, average prob log probability of each pixel as you encounter it in your test set. So you'd say, okay, imagine I have a log probability score of the total image, that's a 28 by 20, oh, let's say 100 pixels, I have some score. Then I divide by 100 to normalize by the number of pixels I generated. If I had three channels, then I also divide by three. And then bits per dim would then look at the two log because it's bits. If it's called nats per dim, see so alternative is like nats. If it's nats per dim, then it would be the uh, regular log, the natural log. So 
to write this in, in code, I guess it would be along the lines of, it would be log probability of some data point x divided by dim of x. And then there would be, um, this, is, this would be nats per dim. And if I made that a two, then it would be bits per dim. Yes, actually, can somebody close the door? You can come in, but it's just some, somebody's talking outside. Yeah. Okay, so the question kind of goes to the very beginning in some sense here, right? You could say, um, or even before, wh why do we want our network to output things that normalized. So the alternative is that essentially energy-based models. In energy-based models, what you output is just for every image, you output a score, an energy. And that's just your energy score. And now you'd say, well, energy has to be low because the probability is the e to the negative energy. Um, so essentially, you'd want low energy, so you try to drive it down. But now let's say you have a bunch of training data. You train on it, and you try to drive the energy down. Well, you could just output the lowest possible number, let's say negative infinity for all of them. And what now? Now you have really good score, but that's not a good model. It's giving everybody a negative infinity energy score. And so when you train an energy-based model, usually the challenge is the normalization constant. You then still have to, you can't just drive it down on your training data energy. You have to make sure it's also in some sense high on your things that are unusual. And so to make that work often, some intractable things have to happen that then get, get approximated to deal with the fact that you need this normalization constant. And so, in some sense, by designing the architecture of the network to make it normalized by design, we don't have to deal with this intractable normalization constant that otherwise come back to haunt you and to ensure that you don't just think you can drive energy down on everything um, because you're only driving it down on training data, not on things you didn't see. That will be in a normalization constant. So the question was um, earlier, can we just have multiple masks? And in fact, this is what was done in the paper. Here it shows um, lower is better when you have about seven, six or seven um, different masks, that is different orderings in some sense of your variables in the autoaggressive ordering, you get the best performance. Once you go above that, performance degrades again. Why could that be? Well, I mean, this is test error. Um, it could be that once you have too many orderings, your network is not expressive enough. You, you, like, you cannot express the mapping from you know, input to predicting the, the next ones in the ordering for every possible ordering at the same time because it's only a small network. Um, interesting thing you could do just playing around with is you could go back to the paper. You could see if you make your network, let's say, you know, 100 times bigger than the network they had, and now you do, you know, see how many orderings uh, where you find that optimum. You probably, with a larger network, will have more orderings that are uh, going to help. Um, but ultimately, the more orderings you have, the harder to fit, and so you need a bigger and bigger network, most likely, to make that work. One way you can also analyze this, which wasn't shown in, in the plot in the paper, essentially, you could also look at your training error. You could see that maybe if you have too many orderings, even your training error you're not able to drive it down. And if you can't even drive down your training error, then essentially you're not expressive enough to capture what you're trying to capture, which is you know, all possible orderings. Now the beauty, if you were to train on all possible orderings, is that you can fill in data in any way. Like, let's say you have missing data um, at some test time, there's some coordinates missing, or some pixels missing. If you train on all orderings, you can just say, hey, let's put the ones that are missing last, and then just run in the ordering that puts those last so I condition as many things as possible to generate the things that were left out. And so you'll probably have a general filler that you, may not, you might not have uh, that ordering available if you didn't train on it. Let's see, what time is it? Um, 
620. It's not halfway yet, but we're about to start something very different. So I propose, can somebody check if there's pizza outside? <laughs> if you're, can, it's here? Oh, can you go, can you help out Alex and uh, Wilson to see how we want to set it up? Um, so I propose we take a 15 minute break now, eat, eat some pizza, and then we'll start with uh, mass convolutions. All right, um, let's restart, and let's restart with this picture over here, because over break I got quite a few questions about this picture. Um, so I want to clarify a few things. So, what were our things we wanted to do, and that's what the questions are about. We wanted to somehow ensure that the probability distribution sums to one. How do we know this thing is going to sum to one? Well, if we have a distribution, that satisfies, if you have an expression here, the expressions together satisfy the chain rule. We know that if we, if this is a valid distribution over x1 at all times, so let's make it concrete. Imagine we're outputting pixels from 0 to 255. If the output on x1 is a softmax, it's forced to sum to 1 for the probability of x1 through that softmax. Then if the output for x2, given x1, is again a soft, 256 way softmax, it's forced to sum to 1. Same thing for x3, 4, 5, 6. That means we are, by architecture design, forcing each individual output to be normalized. So that thing, that box is checked. Then, in terms of the joint distribution, if we have a bunch of conditional probabilities and we multiply them together, if they satisfy the chain rule after multiplying together, this will form a proper probability distribution. So the distribution we're actually having here is px1 times px2 given x1 and so forth till px6 given x1 through 5. This is our probability for the input um, that we get x1 through x6. That is the probability we assign. This will be a number between 0 and 1. And we also know that as long as each of these are proper conditional distributions, then the joint distribution over all these variables will be a proper distribution that sums to one. So that's where our summing to one comes from. Um, each individual output is normalized, and it, the way we set up the architecture, it follows the chain rule. Okay, so sums to one. That box is checked. Then, <clears throat> what else? Um, another question is, how do you, how do you train it? Well, you train it, the objective would be sum over all i, which is um, data points. So from 1 through m, our data points. And then sum over all k, log probability theta is the parameter vector of x, the ith example, entry k given x i 1 through k minus 1. So we have the log probabilities of each output being optimized all summed together. We maximize this over theta. So that's how we train. Um, or if your deep learning framework only minimizes, you'd be minimizing the negative of this double sum. Then how do we sample? The way we sample is we say, OK, what is our ordering? Our ordering in this case is x1 through x6. So the first thing you do is you sample x1. That's what does it mean to sample x1? Well, you'd have to, you feed in whatever came before x1. In this case, there's nothing that came before x1. So you might say, what am I feeding in? Actually, it doesn't matter. Whatever you feed in, it does not affect the distribution we get over here, because we designed the architecture such that the input is not going to influence p of x1. It's not conditioned on anything. So no matter what you feed in, some p of x1 comes out, that is your distribution you're going to sample from. You'll have a softmax distribution, you sample from that. After you sampled x1, so let's say your x1 hat comes out, you now can feed this into here. You still don't know what to feed into x2 through x6, but that's OK, because we're going to be sampling x2. And the way we design the mask is that the only paths that reach x2 are paths that come from x1. So everything that comes after x1 does not influence 
what's on the softmax over here. And so we feed an x1 hat, so we have x1 hat now, out comes x2 hat as we sample. x2 hat then gets fed in over here. We can get out x3 hat, then x3 hat can go in. This is a slow process. Imagine you have a megapixel image. You go through your multilayer perceptron, your mass multilayer perceptron, a million times to get a single image out. And I believe, if I remember correctly, in the made paper, they might have said it took something like 10 minutes to generate one MNIST sample. I forgot the exact time. But it, it, takes, it can take a lot of time because you do go through the network a million times. And so that's one of the downsides of these autoaggressive models. Um, you need to generate all the previous entries before you can start generating the next one. Now remember, it's not always the case that, I mean, you always need to generate all the previous ones, but in some cases like the RNN, you don't need to go all the way from the beginning again. You have a hidden state that remembers things. So it's architected to not have to go start from scratch every time. You kind of just keep going. But here, you start from scratch every time. Next pixel, all the way through, and again and again. Okay, so I think those are the three main questions that came up over break. This was, how do we know it normalizes? How do we train it? And how do we sample? Did I miss any questions? Okay, so that's made. And you'll actually, a quick preview of your homework. Pretty much everything we cover in class today, you will be implementing for your homework. Um, so, um, so, made uses a multi layer perceptron, which has parameter sharing. It's nice when you generate X25, you use sometimes a lot of the same parameters as you use to generate X24 and X23 and so forth. So statistically, that's nice. But let's say you're generating images, you're not using much of the structure of the images. We know components will use more of the structure. Can we bring that in here? Um, we'll first start with 1D versions because it's easier to think about. Instead of having a made architecture, we could have something a little sparser and essentially run a 1D convolution. So what we have here, look at the architecture to generate the next one over here. We have something that looks a lot like what I drew for made, but it doesn't go all the way back. It's a finite window it looks back at. And actually you can do parameter sharing. You can have what happens here to be the same as what happens here and here and here. That's what convolutions do for you. You apply the same mask, not mask, well, the same filter, you apply the same, in this case, two by one filter in multiple spots because you think that the way you're gonna bring in this kind of low level information is gonna be the same independent of where you are in space. And so you'll run filter here, same thing here, that will be another filter, and it could be a filter bank, it doesn't have to be just one filter, it could be many filters, and then same here and here. So this gives you a lot more parameter sharing than we have in a maid. Because even though it might look like a maid, the way it's drawn, keep in mind, again, like these are the same, these are the same, and these are the same. So there's really only four parameter sets here to be considered, far less. And the deeper this network becomes, the more it's going to matter, the more it's going to fan out, and the parameter sharing will help more and more. Um, of course, you, can, you don't have to use a, mask, uh, a filter that's only two by one. You could have bigger filters to look further back and so forth. You could have a deeper network such that by repeated filtering, you can look further back. Those are architectural choices that you make. You play around with those are hyperparameters and you see what works well for you. So the receptive field now, this concept is going to be pretty important. The receptive field is not. So in MADE, the receptive field of xk is x1 through xk minus 1. Here, the receptive field depends on how many layers you have, how wide your filters are. Okay. And so you should think about that. I mean, the smaller the receptive field, probably the faster to train, less parameters to deal with and so forth. But also, if things that are further back really matter, you're not going to be able to see them. So then you can't build a good model of your data. Let's see. Come on, go back. 
So here's a wave net in action. And then the sampling. So we're just talking about sampling. What happens for sampling is that you've generated all the previous ones. Then you do your forward propagation to generate the next one. So here's the one generated. You use that one to condition on, go again. Use that one to condition on, go again, and so forth. Nothing you see here in WaveNet, which is probably the most popular masked 1D convolution architecture. Um, it's um, the, way the, the way the filters are set up, they are set up to kind of go further back by compared to this, this one over here. At every layer, you look at just the, two, the one below you and one back. But here, it's a dilated convolution that allows you to look further back and have much farther reach than you get when you just do the naive thing. Um, in fact, in, historically speaking, WaveNet came out, I believe, three years ago out of DeepMind, Aaron Vandenord, and it gave, at the time, probably still now, but very stunning uh, beyond prior state of yard speech generation results. So there the input would actually be text, conditioned on text, conditioned on text. It would generate sound, condition the sound already generated, feed that into the bottom, generate the next part of sound, and keep repeating this and get extremely realistic uh, speech. Yes? So this output is probability. I remember it was in zero and one. So, so when it down, uh, it means that the input Yeah, there's a bit of uh, abuse of notation there. So at training time, the output is a probability. And we want to maximize the probability of what the actual value is there. At training time, we have the values there. And we try to maximize the probabilities. At test time, all we get is a probability distribution. We sample from it. And whatever the sample is, we bring to the bottom to continue. So we don't bring the distribution down. We, we bring a specific sample instance down to generate the next one. Yes? So why, why sample instead of taking the mean of the distribution? Um, well, so the idea here is that you want to capture the full distribution. And so by, by sampling, you're able to, if let's say there's many modes, many, imagine you have a piece of text and you start generating with a female voice. You want to keep generating with a female voice. You want to be able to do that. You want to generate with a male voice. You want to generate with a male voice. You want to generate with maybe some kind of British accent or Australian accent or maybe a Russian accent. Who knows? You, you kind of want to be consistent and be able to generate all those versions, not just the mean of all of them. And so I would say actually it's a pretty important point is that in generative models, we're really trying to capture the full distribution, not the mean of the distribution. I mean, the mean will be captured implicitly, but the goal is to capture much more than the mean. OK, and then, of course, thought goes into the details of exactly what do you put in these 1D convolutional layers. You put you know, residual connections, um, dilated convolution. A little thing that's used a lot in, um, in unsupervised learning. I don't, I don't think it's nearly as much used in supervised learning as this kind of unit over here. So 10H and sigmoid in one. So the idea is you have your nonlinearity rather than just either a ReLU or a 10H or a leaky ReLU or a sigmoid. You say, okay, it's going to be 10H. I'm going to have an output. I'm going to essentially have, instead of having one output, I'm going to have two outputs. And one's going to be get a 10H applied to it, the other one's sigmoid, and I'm going to multiply it together. What it does is sigmoid goes 0 to 1. This is sigmoid. 10h goes negative 1 to plus 1. And so the sigmoid acts as a gating function. Another place you've seen this is probably LSTMs, GRUs, where there are gating functions that decide whether or not a signal comes through. And so the sigmoid can zero things out, whereas the 10h is in some sense propagating the actual signal that you're trying to get through, or the sigmoid can let things through. So you can actually apply WaveNet and MNIST. I'm not saying that's the thing to do, but I want to show you the generality of what, what you can do. Just like you run an RNN on MNIST, you can just make a long sequence of all your pixels. Of course, there's many such sequences. You may have 60,000 training images. And you can train a WaveNet. And well, what do you get out? It's not super good. Um, but I mean, it's better than where it started. Um, <laughs> so it's better than random. It learns something. What if we now give it the position encoding so it has more information uh, as it's generating things? Here's what you get. 
actually makes a very big difference here. With the RNN, the difference was much smaller. Um, with the WebNet architecture, the difference is very big. Once you do, you do uh, position encoding, it can do a lot better in MNIST modeling. Okay, so that's the 1D version. Let's pause here, and then we'll go to the 2D version, which is at least I find a lot less intuitive, but hopefully we'll, we'll get through it. Olivia. So good question. Is there a model should be our go-to? Um, so people benchmark, and so on different data sets you'll see different things win. So um, we'll we'll probably have some of these tables towards the end, but essentially um, there is MNIST where almost everything works pretty well but it's a good sanity check, and it's fast turnaround sanity checks, and you know you're doing the right thing at least. To, to some extent then, CIFAR, a lot of benchmarking, is a bunch of ImageNet benchmarking. The ImageNet benchmarking gets more expensive because it's more data to process, and unsupervised learning tends to work with a lot of data and so forth. Um, so I wouldn't say there is a single go-to. I would more think of what we cover as a lot of different ideas, even within autoaggressive models that all have their merit and might see their own benefits in different situations. And then this is, we're now in autoaggressive models. And then four weeks from now, we'll have seen also flow models and latent variable models and implicit slash GAN models. And we'll essentially have four choices and within those four, yet more choices. Um, so it's, it's not nearly as converged as maybe your favorite answer to your question would have been, but from a research point of view, you are getting a great answer to your question now that it's still quite open what you might want to do. Um, yeah. Yes? Uh, I thought the information for WaveNet was like model division for arbitrarily long like representative variable. So why are we applying it on WaveNet? Um, well, I told you that um, WaveNet was done for speech, right? Um, and then I told you, WaveNet is not really the right thing for MNIST, but I want to show for the generality that you can also apply it to MNIST. There's no reason you cannot. You can see what happens. So I'm not applying it to MNIST to apply it there to say your future of image modeling is going to be WaveNet. Um, it's not. But at the same time, I think most people would not expect it would work this well as it does here once you just bother giving position encodings. And so I think sometimes, you know, you can think, you can just see these results, which is what people might have tried in the past, and think like, okay, definitely it could never work, but then actually just a very simple change um, can, sh can show very good results. And if actually, this is also what happens in models we'll see later called uh, self-attention models, multi-headed self-attention. They don't know about spatial structure, but then you give position encodings, and all of a sudden they know about spatial structure, and they work really well. Okay, any more questions about what we've covered so far before we do Pixel CNN? Edward, yes. Sorry, I have a so, um, you could just keep on running WaveNet on MNIST, right? Just generate like as many pictures as you want, right? Would that uh, reduce the need to like, is there a clear like uh, drop in quality after like the 30 seconds or, or something? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you can do that. So you could say, after I regenerated my 28 by 28, I'm going to generate the next, another row, another row, another row, and see what happens. Um, absolutely possible, yes. Or you can generate wider images. See what happens. Wider might not work so well, but um, it might work because um, it's all convolutional and it's somewhat shift invariant. Um, with confidence, you can do it. So with Pixel CNN, people have shown, Pixel CNN is essentially the generalization of WaveNet, but for 2D, it's one way to think of it. And uh, people have done it essentially, keep, just keep generating. Even though you train on a maybe 28 by 28, you actually can generate that's something that's twice as large, 10 times as large. I mean, it might not be meaningful at super large scale because the patterns at large scale can be different than small scale, but people have done that and uh, see, they've gotten some decent results. Um, which is actually brings me to another point. Last year when we taught the class, our list of open questions included how, how to train a generative model as independent of the scale of your input. And in the last 12 months that has happened. 
So through pixel CNN ideas, people have done exactly what you're describing, being able to generate at arbitrary scale or scale independent uh, learning. Okay, so next hour we'll see pixel CNN and many of its variations. So we can flatten an image into 1D vectors and run a RNN or a WaveNet. But as I brought up, it's kind of a crazy thing to do. It seems like more of a kind of exercise to kind of see that it's possible than the right idea. Instead, on 2D images, um, you could run maybe made, but then you don't have any parameter sharing in terms of using filters. So how about just using a 2D filter, running it over your image, and essentially think about it, it's made, but the connections are set up as if a 2D filter is being run. You have a component architecture, but you still need to, need to do the masking that you do in MADE. Now, if you set up your entire component architecture and then need to do the masking you do in MADE, um, it's a lot to think about, a lot to keep track of. Um, what happens in um, Pixel CNN is something a little simpler. You just say, I'm going to change I'm going to direct, essentially, I'm going to change my filters. I'm going to mask the filters directly. Rather than mask it in an end-to-end -end way, I'm going to mask the individual filters in a way that the kind of ordering is obeyed, that I cannot get anything to leak from variable, a later variable to an early variable or to itself. And so this is the ordering we want shown here. When generating XI, we want to condition everything that came before. That's called raster scan ordering, line by line going down. How do you do it? you can effectively have a mask that looks like this. If you have a three by three filter and you, it looks like that, what does it mean? If you run this filter over your image, what can any given pixel see? Where, where does it results come from? Well, think about this pixel here. It somehow gets something that comes from over here. That's the only thing it has access to. So it cannot see itself. It cannot see anything that comes after it. It's limited what it can see because it can only see those four pixels but at least it's not violating our um, made-like um, autoaggressive assumptions. Okay, now of course you can do multiple layers. So, um, actually, let, let's, see, let's look at sampling in action. So, we're gonna set up a filter, filters that look like this, multiple layers, and if you apply another layer, what will happen? Um, well, what's the, essentially, what's the receptive field after two layers? Well, I need to understand the receptive field of this one, this one, this one, this one. If I understand the receptive field of those, then that becomes the receptive field of this last one. So this one here will get something over here, and this one will get something that looks like this. This one here will get something that looks like that, and this one, this. So after two layers, what I drew out here is going to be this whole thing here. It's going to be the receptive field. Um, if I expand even more, this receptive field will keep growing as I have more and more layers. And you see that indeed it expands the right way. You can only think, see things that came before you, nothing that comes after you, not yourself. So let's take a look at this in action. So Aaron Van Nord is the um, lead inventor of Pixel CNN, as well as many of the later variations. So what happens when we want to sample from this? We have our ConvNet. We now have the proper masking, so nothing can feed from anything to X1, because the first one will be, the mask will be such that you can't see anything. So then we just run things through. There's a softmax at the end. We sample from the softmax. Get our first pixel. Keep repeating this, pixel after pixel after pixel. Go to the image, and at this point, um, maybe, you know, this is the softmax distribution for the next pixel. Thanks to many layer of conf processing, we look at the, just a one output, look at the softmax there, sample from this, and this is, I mean, you need to do this for three channels, this color image, and this just kind of keeps going, growing an image one pixel at a time to get something that looks like an animal here. Okay, so that's the process. Much like made and others, one at a time, whenever you sample, you defeat it in, go do a full new forward pass. So definitely sampling is not going to be fast, um, but let's focus on the training. So, one thing when I was drawing this out, as, I have many, as we have many layers of conv, um, many conv layers after each other, there's actually a blind spot that forms. You can never reach this area over here. Even though we intend to do raster scan ordering, by doing the 3x3 filter, 
with the masking that we need to do to not get anything that comes from after us, we actually have a blind spot. Um, you might say, I don't care. To generate this pixel over here, what's in that part of the image is not going to affect it. Often that's probably true. It's going to have not that much influence per se, um, but it also depends on where this is. I mean, if this thing is a, if the image is real, an image that looks like this and runs very far this way, you lose a lot. If this thing is all the way on the right, you don't lose a lot. Um, so it depends on where you are in the image, how big your blind spot is. And some, some pixels are going to be a pretty big blind spot. In fact, if you're bo bottom left here, you have a very big blind spot. So um, what can we do? Well, this is, again, architecture choices. How can we choose an architecture such that we don't have this blind spot? Can we find a different kind of mask? And can we do something that um, avoids this? Well, we know we can, in principle, do the naive thing, which is we can set up a full ConvNet, analyze all connections, and then made, mask it out, and make sure nothing goes from anything in the future to your current variable. But that's just not practical. That defeats kind of the purpose of setting up a ConvNet. It gets very complicated because now you have this massive masking to deal with. You really want to do something at the level of the mask, so you really have ConvNet behavior still as you process. So what else can we do to get more information. So when we look at this blind spot over here, how about, here's an idea. Instead of running a filter, a three by three, centered on this guy, um, where we can now only use this, 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 what if instead we run a two by three, centered on this one. If you run a two by three centered on that one, this is the receptive field with one layer. If we have another layer, it'll expand. After two layers, it'll essentially be this. After three layers, it'll be this. and so forth. And what we see here is if we have a decent number of layers, we're going to see everything above us in the image. Some one tricky thing here, what I did is I said, well, I'm centering it around this one. Like, the results come in there. But if I run my filter that way, effectively, I'm seeing myself. Like, if you just run what I just said, the, the whole thing, essentially, by having this thing included here, the way it's set up, by ending up there, it's that horizontal connection made that's effectively running all the way and coming through. So we can't do that. How do we avoid that? Well, what if we actually then say, actually, I'm going to, after I've done all this filtering, I'm going to use it to then, at the very last layer, generate this pixel over here. So I'm getting all this receptive field. I'm, in some sense, bringing it all together into this spot in some way. Um, but then at the end, I'm not predicting that spot because that would be cheating. I would be able to see the input that's there. I'm going to have to predict the next one, next one down. Then it works. Now I have a full receptive field above me. Um, and I can, from that, try to predict the next one. So condition satisfied. Um, this is, in some sense, what we want. We lose this blind spot on the side over here. What we introduced is a blind spot over here. Actually, grab a different color for that. We introduced a blind spot over here. How to deal with that? Well, how about this? We run a separate 1D filter. So we think of this within your row. You, you can think of it as like just learning a 1D thing that's within a row, and you just run a 1D thing within that row for just predicting from these this one. And then, of course, if you have multiple layers, it would expand out. And so we now have a, within the row, separate thing. Within that row, we don't get to see anywhere but that row, the way I drew it. And the thing from above gets to see everything above. Together, they will have seen everything. You can bring your prediction together and have a prediction that doesn't have an, a blind spot at all. I will admit, this is very subtle. Um, from reading the paper and seeing what's online so far, it took me like probably a day to figure out 
that this is what's happening in multiple conversations with TAs and other instructors. Um, but so let me pause here. There's one extra thing we want to introduce and make sure that this part is, is clear. Yes? Yeah, you're getting exactly at the point that that's the missing piece in what I explained so far. I love this question, yeah. Any other questions aside from that question? <laughs> so, point is correct. Like, the linear one seems to have so much less information than the one coming from the top. Um, remember when we had made, essentially, you need this kind of ordering structure? You can actually think of the one coming from the top as a whole as being before the one that is running horizontal. And as you run the horizontal one here, you can actually feed in from the top into that also in every layer. So every layer of, you'll actually have two run in parallel. You have a two by three running its own thing, a one by two or one by three, whatever, a one by five running the horizontal thing. So it'll be two tracks of convolutions, but after every stage, the top can feed, the, the thing that covers the top can feed into the bottom. You can feed both ways, because then you, the, the top gets to see the future. But that one at the bottom comes after the top, so it can receive also the summary from the top um, as it's we're doing repeated convolutions going forward. And it learns how to combine it also. It's, it's a learn, I mean, there's essentially a gate with learning parameters to be learned to decide how much it weighs one versus the other. Um, Um, I believe, I'd have to double check, but I believe essentially the two get summed together, but it learns everything that comes before that to make sure that these numbers that get summed together are scaled the right way so that it works out. So it's one of those things where often um, two data streams will be summed together in deep networks, and you think, like, that's so naive. How can you just sum it together? But you're essentially forcing what comes before it to kind of adapt its scale and so forth so that summing together works out. So the one on top is called vertical stack, and the one on the side is called horizontal stack. And we know how to do uh, 1D mass cons. We know how to do the vertical stack. Again, um, that's just convolutions. So um, this is what the vertical stack essentially looks like. This is two by three. Um, and on the left, you see the receptive field. On the right, you see where it lands, with, well, where the result gets put. And kind of circling back, remember when I, we talked about made, how there's type A and type B masks in that you can have the horizontal connection kind of everywhere, but not in one spot. You can avoid the kind of same thing here. Like there's this, the, the layer at the end is different. That's where you can all of a sudden get into what's below. Um, so here's what it looks like under the hood. There is, again, the tan H and sigmoid multiplied together. This is a kind of gated hidden unit um, happening in both streams. And then the vertical stack stream gets to feed into the horizontal stack stream to help its predictions as it's moving along. But there's nothing going the other way because that would violate the ordering assumption. OK, so Olivia actually asked, um, OK. How well do the different models work? Here's a comparison on, I believe, CIFAR, though it doesn't say, but this looks like CIFAR numbers. So this is the negative log likelihood um, on test. And in parentheses train, I suspect expressed in nats per dim. So, or actually bits per dim, because eight, uniform is eight. So if you have uniform distribution, you don't know what to do. You need eight bits because you're outputting eight bits. If you have no idea what to output, you need the full information about the eight bits. But the more, the better your model, the less bits you need to represent uh, the data. And so here we see that the original pixel CNN, which had the blind spot, got a 3.14. The gated pixel CNN, which 
avoids the blind spot issue has a 3.03. .03. The original Pixel CNN paper had something else called a Pixel RNN, actually very complicated. Um, and nobody, that's an example of something nobody's actually building on anymore, the Pixel RNN. So that's one, but maybe that means somebody should do it again. I mean, you never know. Um, <laughs> but the Pixel RNN seems to be largely discarded. But Pixel RNN essentially is, it's an RNN to generate all these pixels, but you don't just, you then don't take it in linearly. You still have conv, conv layers bringing in some embedding that goes in the hidden layer of the RNN. It's, it's, it's very complicated. That's why probably nobody's building on it. It was the best model, still a little bit better than gated pixel scan, but we'll soon see something that is even better than that. And so we're, we've surpassed pixel RNN with simpler models like gated pixel CNN. Okay, pixel CNN++ plus plus goes and makes a few improvements on the gated pixel CNN. So, so far our output has been a softmax over a 256-way softmax. That might sound pretty crazy because, I mean, a pixel being 233 or 234, who cares? That's about the same. And if it's, it seems like you should learn that, you should understand in your prior that those are similar and not have to learn from scratch that those are similar. So what you can do is you can parameterize the distribution. Instead of using a 256-way softmax, you have a parameterization of your distribution. So what are you gonna put there? Well, you wanna put something there that's easy to sample from and easy to optimize with. Um, because otherwise, your whole end-to-end -end optimization is going to be bottlenecked on that output layer. Here's something very popular, use logistics. So logistic is essentially if you have a sigmoid, which usually is something like this, you can actually parameterize it. You can decide where you put the, the, the mean of the sigmoid and the, essentially the slope. So how much is this sloped here? More or less slope, and where is this centered? It goes from zero to one, which essentially means that this is a cumulative distribution function. So you can think of this as the cumulative distribution function of some density. And we know that for sampling, what you really need is a cumulative distribution function, and then for probabilities, maybe you know, we can work with either one, but so this can be seen as a cumulative distribution function that we can use to find a density, and then turns out the density will look like this. Difference between two sigmoids. So very easy to compute. The density at a point x, easy to compute. That's good, we get the probabilities out. And, and then we're gonna not just have one, because then it's just gonna be a multimodal blob. That's then the only thing we can output. I mean, our network will say, this is the mean, this is the slope in some sense, or standard deviation. But maybe we wanna be able to do multimodal things. Right? Especially in the very first pixel, and in many cases you want to be able to be multimodal, so be a mixture distribution here. So a mixture of multiple sigmoid distrib logistic distributions. Um, you've, I'm sure you've seen a mixture of Gaussians before, it's a bunch of bumps. Um, this essentially looks like that, a bunch of bumps, but it's just kind of computationally easier to work with, even though it looks very similar, easier to work with than um, the mixture of Gaussians. So here's what these individual logistics could look like. This is the PDF, and then this is the cumulative density function. And a mixture could then take on pretty much any shape. What we still have to do is to turn it into discrete distribution, but that's not too hard to do. Think about what does it mean to be a discrete distribution? If I had, let's say, the um, only one of them, the green one, how do I make it into discrete? I can just say, well, in the interval zero to one, whatever probability mass is in here, that's a probability of being, let's say, zero. Or I can center it. I can say the probability the interval between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, that is probability of being zero. Then 0 0.5 till 1.5 is probability of being one, and so forth. And so that's how this is set up. Now these things run till infinity, so when you hit the end, you will still have a bunch of probability mass left that will go all into the 255 value on one side and the zero value on the other side. Okay. So then um, you can train this on simple histograms. So we see here on the left, top left, epoch zero, um, the 
samples. It's a mixture of, seems, three logistics. Um, and then we see it kind of adapts itself to fit to those two peaks. And we see the loss here nicely going down, um, getting a good score, log likelihood score. If we go back to the very early question, is the log likelihood score of just having the exact histogram of the training data going to be a better score? Yes, that log likelihood score will be a little lower here. So it'll be a little better, the negative log likelihood, but it won't generalize as well, and that's why we don't want it. Okay, so that's one improvement Pixel CNN++ made. What else? Um, it decided to capture long-term dependence, which we talked about earlier. Maybe you need to skip connection in your RNN to look further back. The WaveNet did it with uh, dilated convolutions and so forth. Same thing here, you introduce skip connections across your convolutional layers um, to make sure you can bring things in from pretty far back. Um, PCLM++ also uses this uh, two-stream model. There's a vertical stack, horizontal stack. Vertical is shown in green, horizontal shown in blue. So you see the exact same thing, but then in addition to gated pixel CNN architecture choices, there is skip connections and mixture of logistics on the output. And once you do that, you actually get a better score. So a couple of simple changes in some sense. At the same time, maybe not simple because, I mean, trying new architectures, it's always hard to know what to try and which one will work better. Um, but if you try a few things, do it right, you actually get a better score. Now, <clears throat> a lot of recent results um, have actually stepped away from using RNNs and comp architectures and instead used multi-headed self-attention coming from the 2018 Attention is All You Need paper by Fishwania, what's the first name? Ah, blanking. Vazir, Fishwani? Somebody knows? Well, title of the paper, um, Attention is All You Need. Um, it was invented in the context of machine translation, but then found to be useful in pretty much any other data type. And actually has a really nice property that masking is super, super easy. So with the multi-headed attention, you kind of go back in some sense to the made idea that you just put up your architecture and then you do some masking that automatically works out and you're good to go. So what is self-attention? Let's start with attention. In attention, here's what happens. You have a query. What is a query? It's a vector, some kind of hidden vector. I don't know, 16-dimensional, 32-dimensional, 1,024-dimensional, 64-dimensional, some hidden vector, which is generated by previous layers typically. They say, this is, this is what I'm interested in, this is my query. Then another part of the network will have key value pairs. This query will go in, look at the keys, and look at its inner product with the keys. So we're doing query key inner product. The higher the inner product, the happier we are, the better match. Then we essentially do a weighted sum of the values based on how good a match we had between key and query. So if we have a very good match, e to that power will be a very high number. If a poor match, will be a very low number. So it's something we have essentially a weighted average of the values based on how well we're matched between key and query. Now, this is softmax-like calculation. Be careful. You, I mean, it needs to be stabilized. If all the key query products are high numbers, you, it's not going to be stable. You need to subtract out the max. So normally you subtract out the max, and same thing here, subtract out the max to ensure that you have a stable calculation. So that's one attention query. Then another query will come in, and you'll do the same thing and get a weighted average of the values for that other query. And um, one way to think of this could be, OK, I'm, I'm processing some word as I'm translating something, maybe, or trying to interpret something, processing this word, this word could have many meanings. So I might have, from this word, multiple queries going out. So from this local spot of multiple queries going out, a query may be aligned to one meaning, another meaning. Then that query goes out, finds for other words in the sentence, Q 
key values that might be aligned. And maybe for one of your queries, one interpretation of the word, you find highly aligned key values, you find values for that, and you, you're, you know, you're on that track. The other one might not find any matches, and you might not get anything out that you continue with. I mean, that's, that's a high-level intuition. Essentially, you're, you're keeping track of multiple hypotheses, multiple things you can look at for the same, at the same time and see what it is that you see in the rest of the image or the rest of the sentence that matches up with your various hypotheses. Okay, so in convolution, we have this kind of thing that slides over the image. In self-attention, any, any one of these will have its query or multiple queries going to all other spots in the image. So thinking back to main, you look at everything else. So this is essentially much like a multi-layer perceptron-like model. We now need to just do some masking to get rid of the connections that we don't want. Masking is very simple because in self-attention, um, you can essentially just, you can multiply in a um, very, well, subtract out a very negative number um, to make all these values become very, very small, and essentially you get zero out. So one way to think of it is you essentially make this calculation unstable. You make it um, deliberately unstable such that um, e to the very negative number is zero everywhere, and you get out zero overall. Um, so, very simple to implement, and again, the closest model really, even though we see it after Pixel CNN, I would say the closest model is made. You have something that's fully connected, and then you install a mask to not be able to look any, at yourself or anything that comes after you, and then you're good to go. One of the beauties here is that you can very easily try arbitrary orderings. So, this ordering is fine. Now you might say, well, um, that's great, you can try arbitrary orderings, um, but what's so special about this compared to MADE? Couldn't MADE also try arbitrary ordering? So why, why are we going to see better results with this than we've seen with MADE? The thing is that with this, with this uh, self-attention, a lot of parameter sharing is still happening. The way everything is set up inside the, the essentially the modules that set up the keys and the, and the queries, there's parameter sharing across all spots. And so if there's parameter sharing everywhere, you can have, in fact, a very highly connected network like we had with MADE, but not nearly as many parameters to learn as you have in a naive multilayer perceptron. So key is that there is parameter sharing happening inside each of these attention modules. Cool, then here is um, some details of an architecture um, we developed a little while ago called Pixel Snail where we have both convolutional blocks and self-attention blocks. Convolutional blocks, I have the prior that local information is interesting. Attention block gives you the opportunity to look everywhere, not have any blind spot at all in a very simple way. Um, you can also try to visualize the blind spot of these different things. So gated pixel CNN has this. Um, what is this showing? Yellow is the spot you're looking at, and you wonder what, when I try to predict this one, this pixel, the yellow pixel, if I backpropagate in my network, which input pixels have an influence on my prediction? Obviously nothing after you should have an influence, but we can essentially see if anything before you has an influence, and we see that for the, this was with, I believe, random weights. So with random weights, even though we know that in principle gated pixel CNN should have all of this, in practice, I mean, all this, if it's deep enough and so forth, in practice, I mean, the longer the chain, the harder to get the signal. We saw with Pixel CNN++ there were skip connections. And so we see it gets much closer to that ideal. It gets much better coverage in practice of where it can draw its signal from. Pixel Snail pretty much covers it entirely. Not sure what's going on at the top here, but essentially everything but that little top corner is covered. It gets strong signal from everywhere. Because the self-attention model can jump to any previous spot in the image. It doesn't have to be chained with many layers of filters before it finally reaches a faraway spot. Um, just a quick analogy here. A lot of people talk about vanishing gradients in the context of RNNs. Like if an RNN is long, vanishing gradients, what do we do with it? We're exploding gradients. Um, effectively, that's the same thing here, right? It's like you have many, many filter layers, and you effectively have a vanishing gradient, vanishing effect of everything out here on that pixel because it takes so many steps in the network to get there. 
Okay, when we do this, we can run this on MNIST. Here is the results, um, gives nice samples. Um, we can also evaluate this on CIFAR and we see the number of um, bits per dim is actually better than what was possible before. So yet an improvement upon state of the art. Then in the last kind of 20 minutes we have, I wanna go through kind of more quickly through a bunch of ideas where we're not gonna have the same detail as everything we covered so far, but just at a high level I want you to know that these are ideas people have looked at and that have had some good results. So, first one here, class conditional, class conditional pixel CNN. You can, instead of just training on all your data in the same way, you can say, wait, if I want to generate a zero or a one or a two, how can I force it to do that? Well, you can feed in a one-hot encoding into your ComNet that signals what you're trying to generate. So you're feeding in the label, and then you condition on that label to generate. How can you feed it in? Here it's done by, um, you have a weight matrices in every layer that turn essentially the one hot into a bias on each of the filters in that layer. So let's say you have, I don't know, eight filters, then that weight matrix would turn the one hot encoding into eight numbers that are eight biases, one bias for each of the filters. Now we would repeat for um, every, um, every layer. Then another thing I want to show is that these autoaggressive models can generate very realistic images. So this is a pretty recent result, um, less than a year old, because um, a lot of people think, okay, realistic images is always GANs, always GANs, it doesn't have to be GANs. These are all pixel CNN-like models. Um, what do, what's done here, there is hierarchy built into it, which means that essentially, rather than just doing a raster scan generation, you could decide to, for example, first generate a low resolution version of the image because we know that it's, it's hard if the dependencies are too long, you have a very high resolution image, how are you gonna get all these dependencies to work out? Well, first generate a subsampled version, then condition on the subsampled version to generate higher resolution, higher res, higher res, and you can start generating very high resolution, high fidelity images. So you can do super resolution also, which is very related. You can essentially have a, this is the, sometimes the second stage of the hierarchical um, pixel CNN where you have just trained from a subsampled or um, low pass filtered and then subsampled version of your image to then generate the high resolution version. Now again, your network will process low resolution version, many, many comp layers, then output the first pixel of the high dimensional version. you will take that first pixel, also condition on that, process again, generate a second pixel, and repeat. So it's still that all same process of, you know, pixel after pixel get generated one at a time. Um, you can um, do this, you know, to do super resolution on um, more, I mean, in this case, faces, and I think the other one's bedrooms. You can also do things where you say, hey, maybe the way I want to do hierarchical generation of images is not just low res to high res, but maybe first grayscale and then color it in. Because with the grayscale I can set the structure. And again, because signal has to propagate far enough, if I go color right away, in some sense the distance between two pixel spots is three times longer with color than if it's just grayscale. And so you're making that three times shorter with grayscale and then after that, not super resolution, but coloring it. Uh, why are the colors uh, the way they are there? Essentially, there's a colorized MNIST data set where that is actually what the data set looks like. This is not some random coloring after the fact. This is some kind of splashy pattern that is typical for, for the data set and has learned to master that splashy pattern. Um, this is with, um, so you can, Essentially, again, you can do conditioning either on low-res low versions or grayscale versions and then from there start generating pretty um, realistic color images. Um, let's take a step back here for a moment. So we've seen how it works to train. The training is very efficient because training to evaluate the log likelihood is just one forward pass because we masked everything out. So in one forward pass, we get all log probabilities, one backward pass, we get the gradient for all the log probabilities, and we can update the parameters. That's great. So training is good. It's very expressive. 
um, because the factorization is very general. And because it's so expressive, we can use architectures that capture the priors we have about images and other types of data to learn fairly efficiently. So that's good. The thing that's not so good is the forward pass for sampling. So this is now, I think, from two or three years ago, but I mean, it's still today very slow to sample. 11 minutes to generate 16 32 by 32 images on state-of-the-art GPU at the time. I guess maybe today would be, I don't know, two or three minutes, but still a very long time to, to, to generate 16 images. And again, why is that? Because we have to generate the first pixel or the first character, whatever it is you're generating. Then once you have that, you go to the front of the network, do a few, new forward pass, you can sample the next one. Bring the two things you've sampled to the front, do another pass, generate the next one. So is there anything we can do to speed this up? Actually, curious, any ideas? People who have not seen the papers yet, any ideas of how we can speed this up? Bonus points if it's an idea that's not been done yet. Yes, Edward. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting idea. The high level idea that you're proposing is hierarchy. You go course to fine. And why would that speed things up? Let's double click on that. The reason it would speed things up is because if you generate course first, and maybe let me draw this. Imagine you generate Try to generate an image as, I don't know, 8 by 8 or something, or 7 by 7. Um, imagine you first generate maybe this one, this one, well, maybe even more hierarchical. Um, you just generate maybe then this one here, this one. Well, let's take a better structure. Let's say we um, have actually 8 by 8. Eight by eight. So now that we have eight by eight, we could say, well, how about we maybe first generate um, things that are somewhat apart. So maybe we generate this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here, and I don't know, this one in the middle or something. And then you could say, well, okay, that's what the first thing I generate. Then after I generated that, in principle, I mean, this was five passes maybe to the network to generate those five, because that's how it tends to go. You could say, well, how about the next ones? Well, maybe I can decide to maybe, um, as I'm generating anything in this top box, maybe let's also have generated one here and one here. Maybe we say everything in this top box, um, we actually don't worry about the things outside of that top box. As, in, as I can do a separate, smaller network in some sense that does this part and forgets about conditioning on this one, this one, this one, this one. So it's, it goes back to the BaseNet architectures actually we talked about very early. It's actually then explicitly cutting dependencies that the chain rule would allow. The chain rule would allow you to condition on those, but you're saying I'm not going to condition on it. Now by not conditioning on some of these variables, I don't need to do things sequentially. I can do this one here. I can, if I also had this one, let's say, and I could maybe do this one here, this one, if I had one here and here, so I'm filling a few more in. Essentially, I could have four separate regions that run in parallel and follow a similar pattern, hierarchical pattern where I say I'm going to somehow fill in a few spots so that after that I'm willing to do divide and conquer and parallelize it. And so what that means is that we're essentially masking out a lot more than we are required to mask out. We will be less expressive with these models, so very likely the log likelihood scores will be a little worse because not as expressive. But if we choose it in a clever way, maybe the things we don't get to condition on would not have had much signal anyway. And so we're not losing much and we gain a lot of speed. Um, do we gain speed in training? Not really. I mean, in training, everything was just a forward pass anyway. But at testing, not at sampling time, we can speed is essentially, I think, 
split in half, 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 and you can have some kind of logarithmic uh, speed up um, compared to what you'd have to do otherwise. Um, so that's one way. And let me maybe skip, that's, that's the second thing, but someone that we skipped to that. So speed up by breaking the autoaggressive pattern. So here's a slide on that. We first sample the one spots. And to sample the two spots, we only have the connections shown here. To sample the three spots, we only have the connections shown here. To sample the four spots, we only have the connections shown there. And so what this allows us to do is exactly what we described drawing it out. You can divide and conquer and highly parallelize your sampling. It's not that parallel when there is only four by four pixels, but if you have megapixel image, this will make a very big difference. Um, this multi-scale thing, you can then look at the, at the scores of how well it does. Um, and um, essentially, if you look at what it's, the key thing here is improved sampling speed, but more limited modeling capacity because you removed some edges that you normally would have had to condition on, you lost that. So limited modeling capacity, but improved sampling speed. And in fact, this is at the core of scaling autoaggressive video models. So there was some really nice recent work, um, just about a half year old, showing that you can use autoaggressive models to generate videos. So now in goes, let's say, I don't know, 32 frame video, and you use this exact idea to, and this colorized pattern here signals, so like you first generate the yellow ones, then the green ones, then the, or the red ones, then the blue ones, and that's exactly getting to that point. You have a hierarchical generation scheme that allows you to um, do a bit more of divide and conquer, and in this case also builds in a prior, because in video you might actually want this prior, that you, know, how, that you both have a spatial, which is this direction and this direction, kind of hierarchical structure, but also a temporal hierarchical structure. You generate the first frame and the fifth frame coarsely at the same time, and only later fill in the things in between to capture better kind of long-term structure in your video sequences. So that's one way to do it. This is kind of clever ordering of variables and then just essentially masking out more to allow your computation to be faster. What else can we do to speed things up? The other thing we can do that has been very popular in WaveNet, and I think is one of the biggest contributors that WaveNet can run real time and is actually in use, is caching. So if you look carefully at these convolution patterns, um, as you run this convolution to, to sample Y at the top there, think about it. As you sample Y, before when you sampled this one over here, you actually already did this, you already did this, you already did this. In fact, you did almost everything. At the time, you would have had this also, and then this. But there's a lot of overlap in that calculation. So a lot of overlap, and the only new things that have come in after you sample this one is that this one has been sampled, this, these two have been sampled. So, essentially, um, actually, it's, it's not drawn the way what comes here will actually generate this one. Then this one will go here. Um, and so what happens is that everything that happened here can actually be reused. And so the only thing you have to do, another way to draw is when you want to generate Y, you can go back, get this from your cache. All the work that happened underneath, you don't need to redo. You go one level down, the left branch you can get from your cache, right branch you need to still compute, and then left branch you can get from your cache. And so every time you go down, the left branch comes from your cache, you've done that, that side before, and going down you need to keep going. And then of course, this path still needs to be computed because something is coming in from the bottom that is making that different. But what it means is that it's actually now a um, linear calculation in just the number of layers that you have and you just kind of can go linearly through to generate the next one as opposed to having to do all these convolutions through your network that you do naively. 
You can actually do the same thing with, um, so this speeds things up qu quite a bit and some statistics on that. You can actually also do this with the pixel CNN. It, it's in the same paper. It's much more complicated to draw out, but the same thing happens. You're running convolutions, and you can again look, okay, where is this coming from? Have I done this for my previous pass? And if I've done it for my previous pass, what data went into it? And if the data went into it has stayed the same, then I can just reuse it. And so you can get pretty significant speed ups, in this case, without reducing expressive power. Because all you're doing is caching. You're not cutting any branches, not changing anything in how you represent things, you're just caching. Okay, so actually let me switch to my laptop for these videos because it seems like they're not loading here. So to give you an idea of what the videos are like that can get generated, So there's a data set of uh, robot pushing objects actually collected at the Berkeley AI lab worked by uh, Chelsea Finn, Sergey Levin, and collaborators. Then you can see if you can, like, oops, what did happen here? Did not play. Make this full screen for a moment. So what we see here is a bunch of videos generated, all samples, so it's all very small, I mean, the resolution, Video generation is not yet at me megapixel resolutions. Um, I think it's 32 by 32 or something. Um, but you can see that, actually, look at this carefully. These are actually meaningful videos, and these are all samples. So you are using this hierarchical sampling scheme to generate part of a frame, part of multiple frames, and fill parts in, fill in the intermediate frames, and although you have your video sequence. And these look like realistic sequences. And the beauty is there's a very gen generic model. Like, this is, you just have your block that represents your sequence of frames, and you train an autoaggressive model on it with some comp layers, some self-attention, and you're good to go. Um, then they have different versions in terms of how much, um, what the scales at which they do spatial temporal uh, subsampling, but it's, it's actually, yeah, it's somewhat so hard to see the differences, but. Um, maybe the, the conclusion is that bo both actually give reasonably realistic um, videos. Then there's another data set called Kinetics. So there's the bare robot pushing video set. If you want to do some of the video, there's a Kinetics uh, video set. On the left, they specialized on cooking videos in that data set. So here are a bunch of cooking videos. Um, not, not sure why <laughs> and the faces are in there, but that's, and that's what it's called. Um, I think there's a dog watching the cooking. Um, the top is more like cooking. Um, so may, maybe only this is cooking and this is something else, but this is also cooking. Yeah, so, um, the way this is set up is when it shows black, it's the initial frame, but it might use two frames or something to have some notion of, of uh, speed. I don't know what they exactly did there. Black surroundings means initial crown truth. When I switch to the red framing, it means the video autoaggressive model is predicting the frames. Then what they did is they, they did this, and then as you sample, you can actually, as you sample, sometimes you sample things that are likely, sometimes you sample things that are less likely. So they actually start from the same frame, I think 16 times, run 16 samplings, and then after the fact, you can use your model to evaluate the log likelihood of each of your generated video sequences. And you can rank order them by more likely versus less likely, and that's what they did here. 
So on the left are the more likely sequences, on the right the less likely sequences. So what you should see, assuming the model is good, is that things that are out here look more realistic than things you see all the way on the right. So let's watch this again. I mean, I definitely see the dog disappear uh, all the way on the right um, and more naturally present in all the others. But actually, most of them are pretty similar and pretty realistic. And then here is full kinetics data set means they have, this is, it's a bigger data set, many more types of things in it, same thing. The ones on the left are the more likely ones, and the ones on the right are less likely. And they're all generated, but um, considered more or less likely after the fact. Definitely there's a lot of less realistic things here. And in fact, the paper talks about this. The paper explicitly says, okay, we've got some very good results on the cooking subset and on the bear pushing, but we have um, not so good results on the fully generic kinetics data set. So, that's definitely a place where there's a lot of room for improvement um, if you want to look into that. So, the one thing we actually have not talked about, and that was a lot of the motivation of um, unsupervised learning, is representation learning. We've seen how to build a model that can sample, that can evaluate the log likelihood. But usually you say, I want to do unsupervised learning first, and then I want to do supervised learning that works more quickly than it would have otherwise worked. I want to do RL that works more quickly. The challenge here is, how do you get a rep latent representation from a pixel CNN? So with the RNN models, it's not as much of an issue, because the RNN, in some sense, you're, the RNN is building up a hidden state that maybe is summarizing everything you've seen so far in a way that maybe is more directly usable. There might be something there. Um, especially if you run it maybe bi-directional. But pixel CNN, it's, it's not so clear. Where, where is your latent state? In most unsupervised models, generic models, the latent state is the random variable. You go from an input to a latent Z variable, and that Z variable is the encoding. It is the thing you can, it's supposed to come from a Gaussian or something. You can sample that and get something back out. That Z is supposed to be meaningful. And then you start playing games. Like you say, well, if I have two images, I can turn them in both into their Z, Z1, Z2. I can directly interpolate between Z1 and Z2, and then decode, and I'll see a natural interpolation between the two original images. But how to do that with this pixel CNN? It's not so clear. Because the random input is happening at a per pixel base. Every time you sample the next pixel, that's where that softmax kicks in and has that randomness. But the randomness in that softmax is not very high level information, so it's probably not gonna be that informative. Proposed solution, actually Wilson's been working on this over the past year, is to use the Fisher score. It's a very general idea. Whenever you have a generative model, you could say, well, for any data point x, what is the grad log probability of that data point? You say, why is that an interesting feature? Why is that even a feature vector? Why is that something that tells me something about the data? Imagine you have a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, very simple case. Gaussian mixture model, two mixture components. You look at the grad log probability of the parameters at your data point. If your data point falls in cluster one, that grad log probability will say, I want to make that cluster more likely. So the prior of landing in cluster one, that parameter will have a high gradient. You want to increase that. If your data point is in cluster two, trying to get it, the probability of cluster two to go up will be the high gradient thing. And so intuitively, this grad log probability thing, if you think of the underlying model as somehow capturing a multimodal distribution, it's trying to say the mode my data point is in should be a mode with higher probability. I mean, it's, it's a high level intuition, but it's a, I think it's a good way to think about it. The mode you're in should get higher probability. That's reflected in this Fisher vector, Fisher score. And so depending on which mode you're in, this Fisher uh, score will be different because there'll be different parameters that will need to go up or down to increase the probability of a different mode. And so in that sense, this thing gives you an indication of which mode that you're in and could be a great feature vector to use. And so even though pixel CNN does not have a latent space per se, 
you can use this as a workaround to get a representation out. You first train your pixel CNN. Once you're done training, you have an image come in, you want a latent representation, compute the ground log probability score, which is very easy, just a forward pass to the network, just like when you were training. Do a backward pass, the result of the backward pass, that gradient vector, that's your feature vector now. So, let's see if this works. On the left, it's a more naive interpolation scheme with just uh, activations in the pixel CNN. On the right, it's with the Fisher score. And if you look carefully, it's always like, this is real, this is real, in between is interpolated, same on the right. If you look carefully, you would see that the interpolations on the right are more realistic. Uh, let me zoom in on this maybe to point out what it is that we're looking for in these kind of experiments. You try to do unsupervised learning. You try to see, does my representation have good interpolations? What we look for is, well, which one is better, you think, top or bottom? Who says top? Who says bottom? OK, everybody says bottom. What do we look for? What we look for is essentially the top. Why is it bad? It's really the left image all the way. And then it's an overlay of left and right image. And then it's the right image. <laughs> all right? It's, it's not doing anything. It's, what you want is you want it to and, and what that means is that the things in the middle are not realistic faces, which means that somehow in your latent space, you're landing them in situations where you're not where you're supposed to be. Your model doesn't know how to deal with that. You're not in good, good position. Here, there's a Fisher score-based interpolation. We see that throughout, the faces are much more realistic, and especially the middle part is, of course, where this one fails and this one does better. Um, and we see some kind of, and sometimes new people that we're not this one or that person, um, pop up and that's what we want. We want every face along the way to be realistic, not just an overlay of two images. So we have a bibliography at the end of the slide deck. And then the other thing we'll have in three weeks after your homework has been due, um, because you'll build a lot of it yourself also, we will have a collab that will have essentially code for pretty much all the things we discussed in class today. Um, but just a couple of days too late for your homework. Um, <laughs> but this is so you have also our reference of how we, well, we should say, in this case, Wilson, um, implements all these ideas. All right, see you next week. <laughs>